It is my real pleasure to welcome all of you and to welcome our speaker today. Um, this series, the public forum series that we have twice a year, is sponsored by an endowment from Barbara and Richard Rosenberg. I just wanted to acknowledge their contributions to our work here. We're very grateful for their, um, hot, their endowment. It helps us uh, bring you all here and have lovely uh, snacks and uh, great speakers. So we thank them. I also wanted to just take a minute uh, before I introduce our speaker, uh, Ruth Gates, who some of you had the opportunity to chit chat with during our reception, and tell you a little bit about some upcoming events we have going on here in case you're interested in stopping by again. So coming up here on Wednesday, April 25th, uh, we have an alum from San Francisco State who's an artist who works with seaweeds and does these amazingly beautiful um, photographic um, uh, images of seaweeds, but she has a new book coming out, uh, Algal Dreams, Seaweed Stories from the California Coast. She's a photographer, bookmaker, author, and designer, and if you'd like to hear a little more about that, join us here uh, on Wednesday, April 25th. Um, our open house, where you get to come on down to the lower campus and uh, be a scientist for a day, check out what marine scientists do, collect some data points, uh, see what our students are working on, uh, it's a wonderful, um, great for the whole family. So if you want to visit with us between 1 and 5 on April 29th, that's a Sunday afternoon, we'd love to have you come by. And um, another event that we're having uh, after that, if you'd like to come by and see another film that is part of the, an award winner from the um, International Ocean Film Festival, you can see several awards there, Of the Sea, and it's about fishermen, seafood, and sustain sustainability. Wonderful film. Um, so I hope you'll join us if you're interested in that on May 17th from 6 to 8 p.m. So just a few highlights of some of the public programming we do here. Um, I'm not going to go on and on about that. I'm going to introduce our speaker now because that's what we're all here for. Um, it is my real pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Ruth Gates. Uh, she's the director uh, of and a research professor at uh, the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology in the University of Hawaii at Manoa. She received her PhD in 1990 from the University of Newcastle upon Tyne in England and completed her postdoctoral training at the University of California at Los Angeles. She moved to Hawaii in 2003 um, and has built a dynamic and globally recognized research group uh, that focuses on coral health. Uh, I think that's the reason we're all here to learn more about <laughs> how to keep them healthy. Um, she has been leveraging advances in the basic research area um, with her colleague, Madeline Von Open, and together they won the 2012 Paul G. Allen Ocean Challenge. This was a challenge to um, think about how to mitigate the effects of ocean acidification, and their idea, which she'll tell you a little more about, is to assist the evolution of corals and develop capacity to stabilize coral reefs in the face of climate change. So uh, I think you'll hear a lot of interesting ideas about how we could do that. Um, she's published hundred, over 100 scholarly articles, been recognized with many, many uh, prestigious awards, including the University of Hawaii's Board of Regents Medal for Excellence in Research in 2014. And she was Honolulu Magazine's Islander of the Year for silence, science, not silence. Science, <laughs> not silence, in 2016. Good recovery, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, Ruth is uh, also was elected as the president of the International Society for um, for uh, Reef Studies. Well deserved. Glad she's the president there, and is passionate about communicating and connecting science to people. That's kind of a theme of our series too. We try to make people who are really good at engaging um, a general audience and thinking about scientific ideas. Uh, Ruth and her work has been showcased by the media. She was featured in the award-winning Netflix film documentary, Chasing Coral, which we showed about a month ago here in our film series, together with the International Film Festival, Ocean Film Festival. And she is also featured in two new documentary features that were released this year. So go see them if you haven't already. Um, Living in the Future's Past and Saving Atlantis. So some interesting films to see. So. Without further ado now, I'm going to introduce and welcome um, Dr. Ruth Gates and her talk entitled Improving the Prognosis for the World's Coral Reefs. Ruth. Thank you very welcome. much. Thank you. Woo. Thank you. 
thank you so much for coming tonight. I'm honored to be here. It's a fabulous location and a fabulous audience. And what I want to do is run through a, a series of discussion slides, essentially, that outline what's happened to the world's reefs, what we've done about it, what the philanthrop philanthropic community has done about it, and how the scientists, like myself, are trying to shift our career from a basic research, examination, monitor, report, to how do we harness our science and take it into the solution set. And so I hope you'll enjoy the talk tonight. I thought it was really important to start by just giving us an overview of the fabulous things that we call coral. What are coral? They are ancient, ancient organisms that are extremely dependent on tiny plant cells that leave, live inside of their own cells. That, this is a, an animal with plant cells living inside their cells. And when they're there, the plant cells do what all plant cells do. They use light energy to combine carbon dioxide and water to produce a food molecule and oxygen. The oxygen we breathe, the animal uses, the food the animal uses. This all happens during the day and at night. The animal goes, quite, the animal goes more active, it feeds actively. The plant, of course, goes from photosynthesizing, the sun's gone, it's now a consumer. So it's crazy inside these animals. These are pretty extreme environments. So these individual corals are made up of, this coral here is an individual colony. It's made up of thousands of these tiny polyps. And inside here, you see the brown dots. Those brown dots are the plants. So extremely intimate. The plants give the corals their color, their normal brown color. They are packed in there at over a million plant cells per centimeter squared of animal tissue. So packed in there. Um, and the combination of the plant and animal allow for nutrient recycling and the calcification that lays down the solid structure that is what we think is a rock on the bottom. Right? When I talk to people in Hawaii and I say, do you know what a coral is? And they say, well, I think it's that rock on the bottom. Right? And I say, well, it's not a rock. It's actually a living animal. And really, the walking across it, not such a great idea. You know, you wouldn't step on your cat. Probably sh you should avoid stepping on these corals. But, you know, it's a bit of a tough sell because they do look like a rock. So, why should we care about corals? Well, corals are, coral, a coral is just a generic term for over 300 species. 300 living species, and each of those species is a different shape. And they come together, they live together in a certain area to form highly complex and competitive communities where a coral will try and outgrow the one next door and they'll go under and over each other. And this incredible creation can produce an enormous amount of space for other organisms to live in. And many of those organisms are things that end up in our plate. So these are extremely important environments for food security food security. But the structure themselves is sort of exemplified by this fabulous white circle around this island here. And this really illustrates the breaking of storm energy or wave energy coming towards the islands by the reef itself. Where that white area is, is where the reef crest is. And so it's been demonstrated that about 97% of the energy coming into an island can be broken and diminished by the presence of a continuous coral reef system. So extremely important for coastal protection. And in the Philippines and other places in Asia, where people bomb the reef, not realizing that they're living organisms, they bomb to get the fish easily so that they can eat. You will see a break in the reef around here. Directly behind the break, you'll see there's an erosion in the land as the storm energy is just wave coming straight onto the land and eroding. So critical for the protection of land masses. You know, in Hawaii, we are almost exclusively now dependent on a tourist economy. And I work in Hawaii because in my mind, the place I work in gives me the greatest access to the system I love and work on. So it's an astonishing place to be, 
but very fragile in many respects, because if attributes that attract people to Hawaii diminish or go away, the economic stability of the state is then in question. So for tourism, it's hugely important. And we know on the Great Barrier Reef, there are, are many jobs that are tied up with the tourist industry, or specifically around the Great Barrier Reef. So you know, this is a huge issue. And then when we, we think about the sort of valuation, we've, we've recently, you know, the science community, I think for a while has realized that some of the words we use to describe the system have almost no meaning or value to people who work in different systems. And so when we say they're very valuable for biodiversity, well, that doesn't land with a businessman who's talking about dollars and cents. Okay, you've lost a, a, an enormous amount of coral. What does that equate to from a financial perspective? And what will it cost us to recover it? And then what will the ensuing services release in terms of budget. So these are, it, there's been a big move to look at the valuation of nature. And all I can say is we see many different numbers that are associated with reef, and all of them are extremely big. To give you an idea of how, they, how important they are, they occupy less than 1% of the total ocean area, and 25% of all marine life spends time on a coral reef at some stage of their life. That's remarkable as a habitat, so critically important to us. And then lastly, of course, drugs. There are drugs that treat human diseases that have been discovered in extreme places, and coral reefs are arguably, arguably pretty extreme, and of course are known as the rainforests of the sea which really reflects the huge diversity of organisms that you find living in the system. So they are massively important to humans. And when we really think about the reef, as a biologist, I'm fascinated in the biology. But the reality is my fascination is framed by the fact that they help people, they stabilize systems, they allow people to live happy, comfortable lives in the places where they are. Well, we talked about what reefs do for us, and I think this slide is sort of the downer of my talk. Uh, um, you know, and it is a really, really big downer, because I've been studying coral reefs. I began my PhD in 1986, and in 1986 dove on reefs that seemed pretty good to me. And in the course of my life, we are projecting the complete decimation of coral reef systems. That's a projection that's been put forward by the scientists who were in the society that I work with. And it's really, we did the projection really because we wanted to provide policy information for the 2015 COP21 discussion on how and what we should do about warming. And, um, at the time that we did that, at the top there, the first word would have said 30% of the world's reefs have died in the last three decades. Now, that number is 20%, I mean 50%, because we've lost another 20 in the last three years due to a really severe warming event that hit many reefs all over the world. It was shocking, and it's the one that kind of made us go, what is going on? We've lost 30% of the Great Barrier Reef in one bleaching event, and that area had never been disturbed or stressed before. So it was, it's catastrophic, really, to think about these changes in numbers on, on such short time frames. And, and really, if there's one take home from my talk today, I hope that take home is reefs are dying before our very eyes. We have solutions, and we must act now. That's it. It's pretty simple. And a lot of people have said to me, Ruth, you know, chasing coral, it was so depressing. I walked out of there in tears, and I was depressed too. And, and also, my own opinion is, we can't really leave people in this chasm of despair around the problem. What we now have to do is lift people back up with a discussion of the solutions. And so that's what I'm going to do today. 50% of the world's reefs are dead, but 50% are alive. We anticipate that most coral reefs, if left completely untouched, will be dead by 2050. And what this data tells us is that the rates 
of warming are outpacing the ability of the system to recover and adapt. So this is evidence. This is not me just saying, well, here's a few, few numbers. This is, this is direct evidence that we have a, a catastrophic problem. And in fact, coral reefs are often called the canary in the coal mine. They are the first ecosystem that may collapse completely on our watch. That's, that's pretty catastrophic as far as I'm concerned. The good news now, there, everybody's depressed, let's pull us back up, is that, to be honest, corals get stressed, and when they get stressed, they turn white. It's as simple as that. And the reason they turn white is because they essentially lose these tiny plants that live inside their tissues that feed them. So we, we know a lot about what goes on when they get stressed and why they lose them. But what we know less about um, is the massive variability in response to stress that we see on the reef. And this is across all scales. This is a, an Acropora palmata coral, very dominant in the Caribbean, um, until the Caribbean really declined in health. And for most Caribbean reefs, we're looking at 5% live coral cover, down from about 70% in the 1970s. That's ridiculous to even say out loud. I mean, really what it says to me is, wow, we let that system go watching not even trying to do something. You know, I'm not willing to take reefs in the Pacific that currently have 70 to 80% coral, coral cover and let them become 5% in the next 10, 20 years. It's just not even tolerable for me not to try. But you know, the response here is really unusual, and you might say it's the white surfaces that are on the top, and so light is coming in, and there must be some relationship bet between the temperature and light. Here, that's less easy to explain. This is in a bleaching event in Hawaii, in fact, in 2015. White coral here, pretty sick. Same species of coral, this individual is very healthy. On the same reef at the same time, why? Here, this is a, a mixed species assemblage in, on a reef in Morea in French Polynesia. And you can see some bleached, very sick corals here, but others that look perfectly fine. Different species seem to be responding differently. And then, you know, some of the work that we've done across the entire Hawaiian archipelago has really illustrated that certain reefs seem to be very disturbed while others seem to be fine, all in the same time. So really interesting variability that gives me hope, actually, because variability is where there is opportunity. Um, and it's that opportunity that we've been studying in a lot of detail with a simple question, what makes one coral survive conditions that kill another? It's a really simple question, and I wish the answer was that simple. It never is, right? Biology is crazy. These organisms have been on the planet for over 100 million years. We're like babies by comparison. Right? We say we're the most sophisticated, but actually we're just a trial run. <laughs> That's a really interesting way to think about. These are our common ancestors. Right? I live in Hawaii, and people are always talking about our ancestors, and people were talking about hundreds of years of generations. And I said, well, if we're going to talk common ancestors, let's talk corals, because these are our common ancestors. And I think it just gives you the perspective of how linked we are to nature. But what we know from our studies, and this is work that's been done by many, many scientists over a period of 25 years, Probably a thousand publications have been written that tell us that three things are important. Well, who your parents were, right? This is, these are sexually reproducing organisms that are the result of the fertilization of an egg by a sperm. They release their gametes in these spectacular spawning events that happen in summer months, depending on where you are in the world. And it's crazy because the same coral species, you can set your clock by when they're going to release their eggs and sperm with relation to the moon cycle. 
And it's like a feeding frenzy. They release, release all these eggs and sperm, and then everything comes in to eat it because it's delicious. And so it's a gamble of who actually fertilizes. It's amazing to see. It's one of the most magical things I've ever seen. Um, and unfortunately, most of this happens at night. So when we want to study it, we have to mobilize 70, 80 volunteers in the water at night with red lights, because you can't have normal lights because that disturbs the way that the gametes function. Pretty exciting science. The second thing is, we now know, and I wish it, it wasn't the case, but when I started studying corals in the, in, the, in the 80s and started really thinking about the relationship between the plant and the animal, this tiny plant cell living inside the animal, we thought it was one species of plant in relationships with all invertebrate animals that have these things inside of them. And that was a very nice time. That was a very nice time. I should say, we now know that there are th hundreds and thousands of different strains and much more complexity in the, in the group of organisms. We call them a genus, and the genus is symbiodinium. But really, a genus is just too small a diagnosis. We should be talking about an order of organisms, a much broader taxonomic group, but we still call them symbiodinium, spa because it's really hard to speciate at this level. And we know that corals associate with different types of plants, and who they partner with is critically important. We now know that not only are they in really deep association with these tiny unicellular organisms, these plants inside, they also have thousands of bacteria that cover them and are deep inside their tissues and skeleton. And who they have in combination can have a huge implication on how they respond to stress, which gives us two corals side by side on the reef that may be looking pretty similar, but could be completely different from one another. And then lastly, where they live, the context, their environment is critically important. And this is just a, a, a slide that shows you a gradient along this coast of Oahu. And these numbers from green to red, 14 to 62, denote the number of times the corals in that particular pixel have been exposed to anomalous sea, anomalously high seawater temperatures for a week in the last 25 years. So the corals in this place only experience weird temperatures 14 times, but the ones in this place experience them 62 times. That's a huge difference on a relatively small spatial scale. And we know now that when we put instruments in a bay, you can have a reef over here and one in the other corner of the room that have very different flow, light, and temperature, and pH conditions. Really interesting how much variability you see in the system. All three things are important. And so studying this stuff has been really fun. I love it. It's what I love to do. This is why I got into it. Let me study this thing, let me report it in the scientific literature, and let me train people to do the same. So I went on sabbatical in 2010 and had this fabulous experience at NCS, which is a synthesis center in Santa Barbara. They gave me a fellowship. I got six months fellowship from my institution, and I had a year at this place to think a little bit more clearly and to ponder what the hell am I doing with my life? <laughs> right, really, that was the question that I was interested in answering. And I realized not quite as much as I thought. So I was writing papers about the work that talks about genetics and the symbiosis and the environment. And in every single one of those papers, I'd write this statement. And then every grant proposal I was reviewing or every paper that I was reviewing for another journal, I'd see this statement. And this is not the only statement. <laughs> it's just the one that is just so egregious. <laughs> and really, when I say egregious, what I mean is the work that we had done was fascinating from a scientific perspective. We know a lot about the system. It's great. But there's no relationship between that work and 
the need to conserve and manage the reef. They're totally separated in space and time. So it made me ponder a lot the, how do I deal with this problem of really not being relevant? You know, I, I think my parents have got a very, very interesting set of words to say about this, but luckily they have both passed on and they can't share. But, but the reality was, it's this relevance piece. And my system, in the 80s when I was beginning, I was really talking to people who were enthusiastic about the bio, about this biodiversity, it's crazy. Well, here we are, 2018. The context has completely changed. 50% of the world's reef has died, and we're projecting that the rest will go soon. Can I, in good conscience, continue to do the work in the same way as I've been doing it in the past? Is it, is it really what I should be doing with my skill set? And I decided that actually the answer is no. It's not what I should be doing with my skill set at this time. I need to change, because guess what? We're telling everybody else in the world, well, we all have to change our behaviors if we're going to solve this crisis with the warming of the planet that we know is related to the greenhouse gas concentrations in our atmosphere. And we know why they're there. It's because of us. We know it. There's no doubt. It's not debated. We're done. We're over the edge now. So, I then realized I have no idea what science is important to conservation and management, and I'm a scientist. So if I don't know, I need to go out and talk about it with people who do. And started down this road of, let me not be the person who knows everything, let me the person be the learner. So we started convening workshops and asking the conservation and management professionals to tell us what would be the best thing we could do to support you. Totally different totally different stream. And it was really interesting because they were much more open than the scientists that we invited to those same workshops, right? So we're all talking about me, 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 my data, my data, my data, can't let that go. It's way too important. And they're like, here's a system, it's dying and people are dying. Like that's a completely different frame for the discussion. And so we had this amazing time and we came up with eight projects that were equally, deemed equally important by all members of the community who had been at the table. And this was cross-sector. Many of those projects I felt were going to be really easy to move. They were data organization sharing. It hasn't moved. They were water quality. Well, why wouldn't we clean up the water? We know it's killing corals. It's an easy thing to fix. We haven't fixed it. So this was a really intriguing time for me I started to realize that we're doing all this science over here. There's a whole set of needs over here. There's a set of actions in the middle. And for some reason, it's the action space that isn't moving. We know what we should do. There are people who know how to do it. But we're just not doing it. Why? Well, you know, coming back to what our problem is, our problem is the rates of change in the environment the temperature rise, the acidification of the water is just really changing to such a high degree that it's overwhelming the threshold for survivability for the corals themselves. That's what 50% dying in a very short period of time tells us. So the challenge then is to close the gap, right? We need to make sure that the corals adapt as quickly as the environment is changing. And if we're able to do that and try to bump it just a little bit ahead, well, we will buy time as we take the action to reduce the greenhouse gas loads that are driving human-induced climate change. Buy time, not solve the problem. Because, of course, there's only so far that you can push the biology of any organism in a given period of time. And I don't want you to walk away thinking, oh, here's a really great solution. If we do this, we don't have to do that. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying if we don't do this, it doesn't really matter for coral reefs. Because past 2050, we will have been so inert that we may not have them. That's unacceptable. Well, luckily, at about the time that this was going through our minds, Paul Allen put out this challenge to the marine community and said, look, Give us your best ideas to mitigate the impacts of ocean acidification on marine systems. Now, ocean acidification is a problem 
in coral, on coral reefs. But it's nowhere near as big a problem as temperature. Every single large loss of coral has been associated with an extraordinarily high or low temperature disturbance. Um, and we now know there's a lot of really interesting nuance in the chemistry, the levels of acidification on the reef. So he said, give us your best ideas. And my colleague and I, Madeline, had been part of the original workshops where we brought the multi-stakeholder group together. We had, at that workshop, said, what about assisting evolution? What about trying to accelerate the rates of evolution? How, how, is that radical? You know, when we said it, in our heads, the answer to that question was no. That's not radical at all. It's just taking something, far, make it faster. Take something, make it faster. We do it all the time with our livestock. We do it with our animals. We do it with our food. Everything we've probably had on our plates has been selectively bred. It's just the nature of how we operate. And we accept that in our agricultural system because we have to have food on our plates. But in corals, we knew genetics, the nature of the symbiosis, and the environment that you find the corals in all come together to dictate why one survives conditions that kill another. So we said, let's manipulate them. Let's try to selectively breed to direct the genetics, that is, take the strongest corals on the reef today and bring them together because we can. Let's modify the symbiosis. Let's tweak these relationships so that they have the best partners to see them through a stress. And let's play with their external environment by using experiments that simulate the future ocean and pulsing in stressful conditions that don't kill them. Can we get the corals to act differently when they see that condition again? And if we can, would that pass on to the next generation? So these are all things that happen in nature. This is not like strange science here. I think this is quite benign science, actually. Um, it's just never really been done in a wild system like this. And so that was what we put into our 2,000-word essay. And we won the competition with a 2,000-word essay that was a $10,000 gift to us, which is really nice. We split it down the middle. And, um, and we thought, Bob's your uncle, that's the end. It was a great idea. People liked it. But what do we do now? We need money for it, which is really the, the crux of the matter. If you ask any scientist in the room, they'll say, I've got 100 ideas. I just need money to do them. That's, that's the problem. We are really limited with our resources. But then they called us back and said, we really want to invite you to give us a, a proposal to do the proof of concept on this work. You need to cap it at $4 million. <laughs> and Madeline and I you know, clicked our heels together and thought, this is great. A five-year project, $4 million. It's a ton of money to do the things we want to do. It was a ton of money. It was so accelerating. Um, but as part of that project, uh, we put in two-thirds of the project was focused on science exclusively and proof of concept. One-third was focused on awareness raising and education. It's the first grant I've ever really written that explicitly talked about the gap in people's education and the development of science that will never move forward if we don't raise the level of understanding in the general community. And so, so started the crazy path along, well, would you be in a film about this? Well, sure, I'll do that, as long as I'm allowed to somehow talk about the work or the crisis. This is, this is not normal for us to be so vocal in the science communication um, sector, but super fun to do. We're coordinating between two institutions. Madeline works in Australia, and I work in Hawaii, and we designed the project to leverage the differences in our place. No two coral reefs in the world are the same, and between Hawaii and Australia, they are so different from one another that you wouldn't even know you were in the same system. In Hawaii, we have relatively few coral species and massive access. This is the institute on the island, Coconut Island, embedded in a bay that has 52 patch reefs in it that all serve as experimental venues for our work. I can go there, or my students can go there, 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. 
It's absolutely remarkable and unmatched anywhere in the world for access to the living system in a place where we have high throughput DNA and RNA sequences. I mean, this is really extraordinary capacity. In Australia, they have a $50 million indoor facility for maintaining any kind of life, but predominantly corals. And we compared a lot of the work that we're doing. We did the same experiments here and here asking a simple question. Do coral like it outside or inside? <laughs> I know. You're probably thinking, and she gets paid? <laughs> really? <laughs> really. It's true. They like it outside, by the way. <laughs> Duh. Um, and and that's, that's because it's more natural. And they like it, and they like to be fed with water that's directly from the place they've lived in the past, which really tells us important information about how to do these experiments. In Hawaii, none of the corals hybridize. Closely related species do not mix gametes. But in Australia, they do that all the time. And so the question is, can you force that through selective breeding to elicit what we call hybrid vigor, where the hybrid of two species is actually stronger than the two parent species? So these are the kinds of things that we do. We, we, we think about our process differently. We are working with teams of people who are committed to the same things as we are. And that commitment is to the mission of solving or producing solutions to the problem on reef. Not committed to studying them, but solving them. That's a very, very different way about doing business. Our whole intent is to send our science in a very purposeful and mission-driven way. That means you've got to choose your team carefully, right? We are promoting total transparency in our process, immediate data releases. I always argue data is not power, knowledge is power. But if I give 10 people the same data, they'll come up with 10 different pieces of knowledge. Surely that's better than one, right? So this idea that we need to do our data releases, we're sequencing five genomes and releasing the data as we sequence. Not because we want somebody else to do it, the analysis. We will do the analysis. We just know some other people will do some really interesting things with their data and maybe start releasing their data. You know, for some of my students, this is a tricky line because they're getting PhDs and they need to publish in peer-reviewed journals because that's the metric of success that gets them ready for their next step. So we have to be really, really thoughtful about the way we allocate tasks to individuals in the group. Our selective breeding stuff is so simple. Take corals that you know have done well through the last bleaching event, bring them together, let their eggs and sperm mix, boom, you've got an offspring that has been selectively bred. And the question is whether they do better than their parents the same. We actually don't know the answer yet because we've only done this for two years and our corals are tiny, which speaks to the fact they grow really slowly. So now we're working on how do we make them grow more quickly? How do we get them to reproductive age more quickly? And what is the maximum growth rate we can induce using feeding and lighting conditions? These are really interesting and fun things to do. And we engage with a lot of undergraduates in this particular realm of, we don't know the answer, come help us make one. And let's make one that has an overall impact in this big party of wanting to get corals to be growing as quickly as possible so we can test them for stress resistance. This is so difficult to do, I can't even begin to talk about it. This symbiosis, these relationships with microorganisms, corals like who they like, and they hate to be forced to like somebody else. And you know, I'm sure we can all sort of find the, some parallel in our own lives. Um, I like who I like, and I'm not going to partner with anybody else um, under somebody else's instruction. So we thought this initially was gonna be an, an easy one. It isn't. This is extremely difficult to do, and is the one that I'm saying, okay, let's do this in the third position, not the second or first. Very difficult to do. The relationships are very tight. This has been phenomenally interesting. The idea that we could potentially harden corals by exposing them to conditions that are projected for the future, turn on memories 
that not only let that individual, Carl, face the future better, but that memory translates to their next generation, to the offspring. This was very controversial when we started it, but we now have evidence that, yes, we can do this, and yes, we can improve the stress resistance of not only the adult coral colony, but also their offspring, but, and here's the big but, only in some species, right? And it speaks to the complexity. We don't understand the biology of humans at all. We have a big understanding of our genetic architecture, but we're such a complex system that we tweak one thing and another thing goes off. We know that. When you look at the pharmacology, it's very, very complicated. Um, we're dealing with over 300 living species. Some of them are found in some places, but not other places. It's massively complex. There is no corals do this. Some species do this, some species don't. Embracing that complexity has been part of our messaging from the very beginning. There, a coral is not a coral is not a coral. And the sooner we let that go, the better. And of course, when we take really sensitive instruments into the bay, and this is the bay that I work at. Here's Coconut Island right here. With, it's an engineered 28-acre island just off the coast of Oahu. When we look at conditions in two places in that bay, very, very close proximity. We can see that one line, the blue line, is pretty narrow in the variability over time, and the red line isn't. It's much wider. This is in very close proximity. And we've done kind of experiments where we move things from one site to another, from the other site back, and within sites. And we compare those to the parent colonies that still are retained in sight. And it's quite complex. And what we find is, when we do track genotype over space, we find the strongest individuals on the reef retain their strength regardless of where they are. That's great, because if you're going to produce a lot of corals that we think are strong, the last thing you want is to transplant them to a no, no, new location and then go, yeah, this isn't really good for me, thanks very much, goodbye. So um, these are important findings. It seems simple, but they take a ton of people to do these experiments. So. Our science advances. Conditioning works. If we expose our corals to future conditions, pulse in those conditions, but don't kill the corals, they can fix a memory of that experience that then translates forward as making them better able to see that condition in the future. That's spectacularly important. And people say, well, Ruth, you can't possibly you know, bring all these corals off the reef, give them a pulse. I say, I don't want to. What I want to do is to find out how little time I can pulse the temperature at what level, and then we're going to go out to that reef and do it. That is a whole reef manipulation we're trying to design a strategy for, not an experiment in a tank. It's really important to see that scaling is going to be an issue that we have to address really quickly. Corals can be selectively bred. That's wonderful. We can put them together, and we can get them to fertilize and produce offspring. Amazing. It's not amazing. It's exactly what we would expect. Do we expect there to be negative consequences of that? I don't think so. Because we don't expect that for any other selectively bred thing that ends up in our stomach. It's really interesting to think about the different tolerances here. Environment matters. They like vari variability and clear water. We knew that. We knew that. And then strong corals are always strong. I'm happy about that because that makes me feel that what we're doing will be valid as a strategy. We want to do this. We want to develop capacity to restore reefs, to stabilize reefs. Maybe to put green veneers, and by green I mean coral, living coral veneers, on concrete that's being poured into the water to fortify our coastlines. Right? Concrete's non-sustainable. Corals are really sustainable. They build, they accrete, they do things that we hope concrete will do but never does. They're fantastic. We really want to think about corals as our friend. They're there, but we don't want to plant gardens like this. We want to build reefs like this. This is what the restoration world is focused on, but this is what we really need. How do we design the reef? That's what we have to do. There we are. I'm going to admit it wasn't a popular idea to everyone. 
We were constantly getting questions from our scientific colleagues only. I can't believe you're thinking of doing this. GMO for corals, Monsanto for the reef. I mean, you name it, it came. And it came in 2015 when we put the idea out to the public. And then we lost 20% of the world's reefs. And now people are like, how do we think about this going forward? The whole conversation has shifted because we lost so many corals so quickly that really some of these issues have just receded into the background because we said it's evidence-based, what doesn't work we'll admit, and it's a proof of concept. We're doing the science, we need to turn the science over to the people who propagate corals, and the propagation people need to turn it over to the people who engineer and back design reefs. And that design has to reflect what people from the places need. Right? It's not me who's going to go to Jamaica and say, yeah, yeah, you should do it this way. It's never going to be me. It's people from that place. But I have to say that we got a lot of criticism. And whenever I take criticism as a scientist, I first go, oh, that's a bit irritating. Um, and then I go, you know, but there's a lot of concerns. So we need to address the concerns. And at about the same time, I was approached to do strategic planning for the Biosphere 2 ocean in the middle of the desert, just outside of Tucson. And this ocean used to be a coral reef. And the whole Biosphere 2 has changed hands. So I thought, this is it. We've got an ocean. It's unused. Let's make it a coral reef demonstration site. Let's test the most radical of our approaches in a safe place. It's an amazing place. If you've never been to the Biosphere 2, all I can say to you is go, because it is awe-inspiring what the people who did the design originally did. It's an, an astonishing feat of engineering and extraordinary capacity for what we want to do today. And so we are currently in play to build this system to accept corals and back design a full coral reef. And we're hoping to do that in three years with climate optimized stock. There's nothing to lose. There's nowhere to go. It is a safe test environment. But we aren't going to do this behind closed doors. Every single part of that experiment is going to be visualized using camera systems and live streamed through the web to engage people in, look what we're doing. There's a few corals here. This coral came from the Red Sea. I wonder if it'll grow next to a coral from Hawaii. Because I tell you, in 25 years, that's the discussion we will be having if we don't implement quickly. Super exciting. So we started to think about what we could do and how we could do it. And somebody asked me, I did a Vice episode, and somebody said, what will it take, Ruth? And I said, $100 million. <laughs> right? And so then people were saying, well, give Ruth $100 million. It will work. She knows what to do. And I was like, no, no, I don't really know what to do. But it's going to take that kind of money to distribute what we want to do to the number of places where coral reefs exist. They exist around the globe. We need to convene the community to do it in place with their species to reflect their needs. We can't be the people who tell. We need to be the people who support. And we need to work with many communities simultaneously. And you see it emerging now with new insurance policies coming out for the reef. The business community saying, well, tell us the right numbers, and we can calculate the return on investment. We're really interested in working with you. This is a billion-dollar industry we're talking about here. Would you let that go? No. So very fascinating time. The thing is, there's a lot of different things that we can do. And some of those things will be really valuable in Hawaii, but will be totally invaluable in Australia or in the Caribbean. We need to acknowledge that and move on. Pick and tune the solution to the place and what people from that place want from their reef. This is a different set of conversations. We have to go to people in place. We will never distribute this as scientists. You know, and to be honest, we're already in the next phases of this work. So we're doing the proof of concept on the science, but we're already discussing the technology that will enable us to address what I see as a massive bottleneck. Which are the stress-resistant corals on the reef today? That's a, we need to be able to identify them. And in Hawaii, we work there 365 days a year. So when a bleaching event comes, I can send a drove of people out with tags, and they tag 
with odd and even numbers. Things that bleached, things that didn't bleach. Things that bleached, things that didn't bleach. And so we can track them over time. And we can use them to test technology. And this test was done in collaboration with Greg Asner and the Carnegie Airborne Observatory. He has a crazy camera called a hyperspectral camera that visualizes aspects of the biology of corals across an entire landscape at very high resolution, individual coral colony resolution. And we asked a simple question. Using your camera, can we detect from your images who's stress sensitive or stress resistant? And the answer is yes, we can. We don't know why yet, and in fact, it's opened up a completely new area of biology for us because the things that distinguish the corals aren't in the places that we expect in the biology. So that's fascinating. Here's some new basic science emerging. But does it really matter for scaling? No. It doesn't matter why, it just matters that we can. And then we ask the second question. Can we only do this when the corals are at their most seasonally stressed, in the middle of the summer? Or could we do it all year round? And the answer is all year round. That's amazing. We still, I mean, I can't even believe it worked, frankly. But it took the combination of amazing aerial technology and an extraordinary living library of corals on the reef to reconcile that and answer that question. So this is spectacularly exciting because it tells us we can identify the starting material for assisted evolution, for moving corals around that are very, very stress resistant, and for immediate propagation through classic restoration tools that are already being used. Pretty exciting. This is again funded by Paul Allen Philanthropies. Very short, sweet, nine month project with very simple questions and very simple answers. Amazing. And then lastly, we now know there's this massive emerging tool in the satellites. Our planet is being imaged every single day by a set of satellites that are around the circumference of the planet. And in their images, they capture coral reefs. So the question is, can we use those data to inform the state of coral reefs everywhere in the world simultaneously? And if we can, can we see changes in the reef that reflect either the onset of bleaching or restoration activities that are either successful or non-successful? Right? This is a very, very exciting set of ideas. And this is a discussion that is in play right now. The change detection, if we could see bleached corals starting to emerge in a place, we could get people out into those places very, very quickly, get some water moving over those corals, put some shade over them, and we could mitigate the impacts of bleaching right now. So this is super exciting, but as you probably realize, as I talk about it, all of it is predicated by collective action in many groups who come together to effect a solution. There's no one community who can do this alone. In fact, my greatest fear is that the science will be developed and it will never be used. And it will never be used because we cannot pull the network of people together to get it done, which is why I stand on a soapbox like this and Send out the knowledge to you so that you can start thinking about how you can engage with this problem at some level. What is your problem that you want to solve? And how does your unique skill set, how can it be trained to solve it? How do you act? What's going to stop you from acting today? And that's the discussion we have all the time with my community, with my students, because at the end of the day, this is what's at stake. This is what's at stake. And so I'm going to end here and say so, thank you so much for coming and for listening. Um, it was really a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So 
those of you who have been here with us before know that we um, open up the conversation to the audience. But before we do that, we invite a couple of our graduate students to interview Ruth with a few questions. And then we will open up it's sort of a warm up for you to think about what questions you'd like to ask. So I'm going to invite our two students, graduate students, up. I'm going to introduce you. Oh, look. Jamie and Chelsea. <laughs> Okay, we're gonna, you're gonna help us, we're gonna move chairs. We're gonna do a little moving. Oh, I'm not sure I can get up that high. <laughs> I know, I'm not sure I can get up that high. <laughs> Thanks, darling. You do it, darling, you do it. You be in the, you be in the. No, 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 you go in this, no, 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 no. <laughs> I got up here once, darling, don't make me do it again. <laughs> so I'm just gonna take a, a brief minute to introduce, these are two of the graduate students in our master's program. Um, I have Chelsea, um, <laughs> Wegener here. Sorry, give me a minute. Uh, Chelsea Wegener here. She's actually my graduate student, and she actually has actually done coral reef research in the Virgin Islands for her undergraduate um, research project, and she actually published her paper on it recently. Well done. Congratulations, Chelsea. Um, <laughs> she's going to be uh, transitioning from some of her research on ocean acidification on corals to understand how changes in pH are influencing the reproduction of a seaweed here that's important for restoration in San Francisco Bay. Um, Jamie Yin, who is also another one of our graduate students in our master's program, she is very interested in understanding the base of the food web and how light and nutrients are affecting phytoplankton in San Francisco Bay. And uh, what you may not know is actually the light levels in San Francisco Bay and nutrient levels change, and they're changing in part because of the historic hydraulic mining that we've done and the sediments that are changing the bay. So it's very interesting questions there that are relevant for the quality of San Francisco Bay. All right, that's it. I just wanted to tell you a little bit about them because they're awesome. Um, and they are going to go ahead and um, ask Ruth a couple of questions, and then we'll open it up for all of you. So oh, thanks for that. I'm going to hand you. I have another mic. Hello. Okay. Is this close enough? Yes. Good. Well, Ruth, thank you again for the amazing it's talk. Pleasure. It's been great. Um, we have a few questions for you. Our first one is, what advice do you have for young people who are pursuing a future in science? Get busy. <laughs> so, um, I mean, you know, I mean, your generation is going to solve the problem. We're going to develop some ideas but your generation will refine those and they'll take them forward and there'll be more solutions. So I think that, you know, somebody said to me quite recently, they felt very burdened by what our generation is leaving behind. That was such an interesting statement to me because it, it just hadn't really hit me how profoundly troubling a lot of the news is. And a lot of the news cycle is about reaction, things are really bad. Um, I think. For the students of today, it's all about identifying what your passion is, what the problem is that you want to send your purposeful science towards, and starting, not waiting for too many people to give you permission. If I have one regret, it's that I realize I could probably have turned my science earlier, and should have, if I'd been thinking. And I guess that would be my last recommendation. Really think about what it is that you're doing and think about whether it's working and if it's not working. And if it's not working, don't pursue it until you want to stick a pencil in your eye. All right? <laughs> don't do it. Perfect. Thank you. That's great. I won't do that. Yes, thanks. <laughs> Um, in what ways can those who rely intimately on coral reefs be involved and facilitate the conservation of these productive ecosystems? It's a great question, and I think I alluded to um, the answer in my talk, but I want to reinforce it here, that coral reefs are very different around the world, and people's intimacy and dependency on those systems also differs. So what I might think is a priority based on my experience in Hawaii or in some of my other research environments may actually not be a priority for somebody who is on a reef in Fiji. So it's this top-down isn't going to work in this case. It's going to be a bottom-up discussion of what, what species are important, why, what do you want to accomplish with your reef, and let's design something together. 
So it's very much about engagement of communities over large landscapes that will affect the change in the, the short time that we have available. It's a test case, really. How quickly can we mobilize a movement? Thank you. Our next question, in your paper, Building Coral Reef Resilience Through Assisted Evolution, it states that although addressing the root causes of climate change is important, it is also necessary to augment the capacity of reefs to tolerate stress. Mm. As a society, how should we balance our efforts? Yeah, I mean, this is, this is the problem. When you're dealing with a wild system and our general approaches have been, let's protect it and let's manage people's behavior in the space with a hope that it's gonna be okay. I think the problem is that the warming conditions that are now starting to occur more, more frequently are now washing out the value of that protection. And, and the Great Barrier Reef, I'm afraid, is the example that tells us that marine protected areas are not quite enough. Now, what I will say is we should augment and protect and likely an augmented protected system will do way better than an augmented non-protected system. So it's again, let's be really smart about the range of options and choose the ones that we think will facilitate the greatest capacity to withstand the future. That's all we can do. do can, we, can we guarantee we'll be successful? Absolutely not. And, but if we don't try, I know we won't be. So, I mean, that's really my position. It's like, what have we got to lose by failing? Nothing. We tried. So, kind of following up on that last question, marine protected areas, MPAs, have been effective in helping fish stocks recuperate from overfishing. How can MPAs protect corals against the effects of elevated sea temperature and ocean acidification, stressors that cannot be contained? Yeah, uh, this is a really good question. MPAs are really, really important. So I don't want anybody to walk away from here thinking that MPAs should not be done. They should definitely be done. And because we know that a more stable living system actually moderates the chemistry of the water. So you want to protect your stable living system. The trouble is, we know under certain conditions that are becoming more frequent as climate change intensifies, that the temperature will overwhelm that. So you wanna buffer it as much as possible when everything is good, and then offset the impacts of these up and down temperatures that are driving the mortality. So it's a definitely, an, it's not an either or, it's a both, and hopefully someone in the room has even better ideas. And those can go into the portfolio, and all of those can be tested quickly. Because one thing I'm sure about, I know what I know, and it's this much. <laughs> people in this room know this much. So the more people who think through the problem and think through their solution, the better it's going to be. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you alluded to this a little bit in your talk, um, mm. but what fueled your shift from simply recording the decline mm. of coral reefs to being actively involved in the solution process? Yeah. I mean, I think if coral reefs had been stable through the period of time I'd been studying, or had gone up and down, up and down, up and down, I would say, well, you know, this is within the realm of how dynamic systems are. You know, coral reefs actually are not very stable places. They get hit by storms, there's all kinds of things. You know, crown of thorns, this horrible <laughs> starfish that comes in and eats all live coral. I mean, there are disturbances that happen on coral reefs and have historically over time. The problem is the frequency of the large temperature disturbances that are really driving the death on reefs have gone from, you know, 24 years to 12 to six years. And the projections for the future are even shorter time spans. It's a no, there's no system that can be pushed this many times, which is why I say, yes, augment the biology, but use these visual tools to tell us when something's going wrong and get in there and mitigate with just a local solution that can be implemented by teams of people everywhere. So that will offset impact, which is, of course, what we need to do. Again, just many things implemented in the right moment can make a huge difference. Thank you. Okay, okay last question. 
Doing coral reef research can be a little depressing in this day and age, <laughs> yet you manage to convey a hopeful outlook. What keeps you going? Well, it's, I mean, it's such a wonderful question. It's a very personal question, actually. I love the system, and I love my job. So I'm really lucky that I found a system that I found fascinating. I was educated by others who had studied the system before me and by people who were willing to share their knowledge. Um, and technology over that time has really, has really changed the way that we do our science. If you look in a medical lab and a coral reef biology lab, the tools are identical. Right? So I've been really lucky to be able to study corals when I just wanted to study. And now I see, oh my goodness, maybe I left it too late because I did my PhD research in Jamaica and the reefs are not in good shape. So what motivates me now is the urgency to, to try to fix the problem. Who else is going to do it? If I can't, with all of the knowledge that I've acquired over my career, if I'm not brave enough to step out, who else will be? And I think it's really about that. And really, when you think about what have I got to lose, well, absolutely nothing except for the system I love. So I hope that answers your question. It does. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. So thank you very much, uh, Jamie and Chelsea. Jamie and Chelsea are going to hold microphones and come up to uh, whoever Ruth decides to pick on uh, who would like to ask a question. So uh, we'd like to open up the floor and go ahead and raise your hands, and you guys will coordinate which one. <laughs> Yes, right in front of me. Thank you. Um, thank you. Great talk. Um, my question has to do with the mitigating measures. When you recognize something regionally that's happening, what can you actually do? You yes. mentioned shade. What else? Yeah. And how? So that there are two things that we know that a coral that's actually bleached that gets put into quite high, high flow conditions will do much better. It will threshold for longer before it dies. And so this is the sort of rationale for what's being done on the Great Barrier Reef, that there's a company who's developing the capacity to move large amounts of water. And it's taken huge criticism, as often the first attempt does. So the movement of water, but also, you know, people say, well, you can't possibly shade the reef. But the bleaching events don't really unfold regionally. They unfold in certain parts of certain places. And so with drone technology, it's quite easy to think about, well, I've got drones that are holding four corners of a large piece of shade cloth that can be moved in place and move with the problem. So there's tons of things that I think, when you say you want to shade the reef, in a lot of people's minds, that means you physically going out and holding a shade. Right? That's because people say that's ludicrous. They don't say, well, that's quite an interesting idea. How could we do that? What is the best approach to that problem? What size of a shade cloth? Because until you really think about those issues, and that will only really resolve when we have this very good idea of what's going on spatially in landscape form across many reefs. Because, you know, I'm going to say this, and it's a little bit, um, you know, I say 50% of the world's reefs have died. Well, the reality is we've studied a very small percentage of the world's reefs a lot. So we extrapolate, uh, extrapolate quite extensively over space because it's very time consuming doing it by hand. So there's two ways the, the, the satellite derived data can go, of course. They can confirm what we already know and they can track declines in places and tell us which places we need to look to see what's driving those declines. So, or they say, well, the 50% estimate's way off. Actually, we still have 80% of the world's reef alive. I would be ecstatic <laughs> if the latter was the case. And my gut tells me it will not be that. But I wish it is. So I think that there's a ton of things happening that have to happen all together, and then we have to put it out to people who are open listeners and conversationalists, rather than defenders. And that's just a big conversation as a species that I think we need to be having is, we can solve tons of problems if we just open up and talk about them, and be prepared to go through the uncomfortable moments when the room goes silent. Right. <laughs> 
Yes. Hi. Yes. So, do you feel? Uh, uh, thank you. Do you feel a sense of optimism around the fact that um, induced conditioning works? Yes. That if we have, you know, a minor slowdown in in bleaching warming events, that you know, we could get start to see some accelerated evolution happening in C two. Yes, I do. I do feel pretty confident. But those bursts that we're using are fairly short, quite extreme, right? So it's like, you know, really our question was, do corals show any sign of a memory that could be induced through, say, an epigenetic change? And um, the answer is some do, some don't, which complicates the matter significantly. And the ones that do tend to be smaller, weedy species that actually you see recuperating very, very quickly on disturbed reefs. And it seems their role is to disturb the flow conditions. So you create eddies, and then the larvae of the slower growing species get drawn down in the eddies. So they have a pivotal role in the transition through early succession processes. Um, do we have time to let all that play out? Probably not. And so understanding that from sort of the ecological studies, I think we already have a good enough idea. Could we mimic that on a denuded reef by putting artificial structures in? I think the answer is yes. Is that a strategy we should try just to get the corals down on the bottom and then pull those structures off the reef? Those, these are all things we should discuss. And we should discuss it against the relative risk for that place of losing the reef that either does or doesn't feed the people, that either does or doesn't protect the land. I mean, in Hawaii, we have already destroyed a lot of reef. I mean, I'm just gonna say that out loud, right? We've dredged parts of the reef, we've used it for building materials, we've done things with the reef that were done before people really realized how important the natural system was to us. And now it's all about restoring, so break it, fix it. But we could not have to break it. That's, that's what I, I feel. There are some reefs that aren't broken, and we should sustain those reefs and improve them, and we should fix the ones that are broken. But let's not have one rule across those very different circumstances. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Yes. Let me run a scenario by you. Let's say I'm the, a developer of um, a number of water-based resorts. Yes. And I feel and know that reefs offside my resort would be very attractive and build visitors and money and like yes. that. Can, you, can your findings result in the creation, I'm interested in a proactive approach to reef growth? Because I can see how that argument would be very persuasive yes. to a resort, let's say Club Med, which is going on an expansion program. We would like to have these reefs off of all of our resorts. Yes. Can what you're, is what you're doing, for, can that facilitate that? I think it can in some places. And you hear me with a caveat there at the end, because coral reefs grow in certain places that coral reefs like to grow for a reason. And so off some of the resorts, there will have been reefs or still are remnants of reefs. And I think that those are places where a reef could be build, built that could be climate optimized. Um, in places where you have a resort that does, has not traditionally had a reef, there's a reason for that. And it's the conditions, the flow, the salinity that is just not well tuned to coral growth. And so again, it's about this, well, let's bring the scientists in, do an assessment, let's look at historical states, and then let's do, and it's not a five-year study I'm talking about. I'm talking about a six-month assessment that gives you a product that says, it's a good return on investment to put a reef right here. It is not a good return on investment to put it here. This is. You can put the reef in, and you can put the reef in with the most resilient corals from your place. Um, so this is, this is, I think, a, a turn in the conversation. To, I mean, when, you know, I've spent quite a lot of time in China, and China is a fascinating place where nature serves people, because there's so many people. But I've seen some of the best reefs I've ever seen in China around some of the tourist islands because they've created our slightly exterior structures that are massive cement structures that recruit fish, 
The fish come in, they clean the interior coral reef, which is the natural reef, and then they go out and they dive the tourists on the outer structures because they've got more fish and the tourists are interested in fish. Now there's a brilliant coral reef. So there's tons of really interesting models, and I think, you know, having a discussion of all of them, what the relative merits are, where the effort should be put, if there's money to do things, I've been in discussions with a lot of the people who are in hospitality in Hawaii about their desire to contribute. And we were talking about 10 properties in one location. Why not put different nurseries for different species in each of these properties, and then you have capacity to restore reefs at all species levels. I mean, these are, this can be done now. We're not, we don't have to wait. And I guess that's my, my real take home is, there's, we shouldn't wait. It is unfolding and we are in climate change. It is not a thing that's gonna happen. And I was in a planning meeting recently where people were saying, well, let's put 2100 on the table as the planning date. And I was like, well, I'm, I'm out of here then. <laughs> They were like, well, what do you mean? I said, all projections put coral reefs out of the game at 2050. You are 50 years too far ahead, and we are the people who should know the best. What is going on? It's delusional. It's just not accepting the evidence. And, you know, with the science community, it's always this, well, there is always a but, but is that but in the 95% area we're all confident, or is it in this tiny 5% at the other end? So I'm constantly asking people to step back to where we agree, and then let's work down so we can reconcile where we disagree. It is not a simple problem, and actually I think it is a huge social experiment. Because I don't know why we're stationary. We all are. I don't know. So I'm open to any suggestions for how we move the needle because it's not moving fast enough right now. Thank you. And we actually have a question from Maine campus, so Aaron. Hi, oh, yes, hi. This, this question is from our geography department that's hi. watching on the live stream from uh, Maine San Francisco State campus. Mm -hmm. So the question is, um, are coral reef researchers doing anything different from the average person to help reduce greenhouse gas emissions? That is a really great question. I hate to say it, but I am just gonna be filmed turning vegetarian. I am not vegetarian. And, um, you know, this is a, a, a very tricky issue. When you're telling people that there's lots of things that we can do, and a lot of that involves changes of behavior, you better be doing that change too. So it's a great question. Not everybody is, but the more we get started and the more we commit and do it in a visible place, the better, because others will follow. So I would like to thank you for a very inspiring presentation. Thank you. And as someone who's going to be here in the year 2050, I would like to ask you, um, have you been presenting to youth middle schoolers my age as educating on them on how to be part of the solution and not the problem? Because I feel like your inspiring talk would be much appreciated. I would be very honored if you would present in my class. Aww. Absolutely. <laughs> I would be very honored to. <laughs> so, I mean, I think it's a great question, and um, really, we have to reach out to everyone. And where better to start with, with them with people who can influence their parents? Because let's face it, my parents were a bit stuck in their ways, and I would have a lot of discussion with them about what was going on in the world. And, you know, we'd go through the facts, and I realized that, well, the British media is telling a totally different story from the American media. I don't know which the true one is, so let's talk about both sides of the coin. But this starting the conversation, talking to people about how to talk to their own parents and think about their own solutions. As I said before, it's just time to get started. You've already started. You're in the middle of the room doing something really <laughs> proactive. So I will come and speak at your school. It's <laughs> cute.
for, um, thank you for being here. I have a quick question for you. Yeah. We had a film at the film festival uh, by a Hawaiian filmmaker, Melina Fagan, and it yes. was called Reefs at Risk. Yes. And it introduces a new subject matter that I think most people aren't aware of, but it's oxybenzene. Yes. In suntan lotion yes. and suntan oil. And they make the correlation between the increase in tourism on the islands of Hawaii with the increase in um, coral bleaching of coral reefs. And they attribute part of that to the use of suntan oil and suntan lotion and, and the, the chemical of oxybenzene. Yes. What are your thoughts? Can you share us? Yeah, I can definitely share my thoughts. Um, it's very controversial, actually. So, I, you know, there are about 10 stressors that affect the health of coral. And... Oxybenzone, the chemicals in sunscreen, are in that list, but at the bottom of the list. So if we were to prioritize them by their actual impact, probably lower on the list than, say, temperature. But, as I always say, the relationship between sunscreen and people and corals is a huge elevation in the discussion. So from a people understanding their relationship to the problem, it is a number one. So it's, it just depends on which part of the story you're involved in telling. And, you know, we've just recently, um, we have a, in our society, we have a committee who, are, who were asked to generate a, a, a statement for an international body to help drive policy in this area. And the conclusion of that was, it is an emerging science field that will require more engagement by many more scientists to resolve whether or not the oxybenzones are causing bleaching. But when you see bleaching, it is always related to elevated temperature. And that is in places with tourists and without tourists. So it is a really interesting um, piece of the picture. And then other scientists will say, well, we should only be studying oxybenzone on reefs because we can do something about that. I think it's really good. I would advocate if it's bad for corals, slathering it on the largest organ of our body is probably a really bad thing to do. <laughs> They are our common ancestors. So, you know, I always take the argument that way, that, look, there's evidence that there's some problem with corals. If it's bad for corals, it's really bad for you. Put a shirt on, put a hat on. Don't slather that stuff on you. Don't do it. Because it will be seen to be a really big problem, I think, in the future. It's a great question. Thank you. Yes. Right at the back behind you, I'm going to go, and then I'm going to come forward one, okay? Thanks, I guess. She had her hand up first, so you know. Oh, you have hand up. Yeah. Hi, thank you for such a wonderful talk and a really it's helpful pleasure. talk. Um, you mentioned right towards the end this idea of insurance companies. Yes. Um, insuring reefs, and I'd love you to talk a little bit more about yeah. that. So this is just beginning to emerge with the insurance industri industry weighing risk of loss, right? And so they have already funded large-scale reef surveys, um, and they do it through their nonprofit arm. But of course, it's all about trying to understand how much change is happening, where the biodiversity is, and what the potential business opportunity might be. And it's just beginning, I think, in Belize, in the Mesoamerican Reef, um, they announced in the last month, and I'm not quite sure what the details of that package are, but the, the headline was the insurance industry is stepping up. They have to, because the coral reef is protecting the land. The land has people and structure. So minimizing risk to the structures and the land is critical. And so that is, I think, the, the sort of the major theme in the, in the insurance, reinsurance interest in reef systems. And, you know, to be honest, they really didn't know they should be interested because we'd failed to do the education. We'd failed to say A, B, and C, and we started all our talk, talks at M. <laughs> so these really foundational pieces of corals are animals, they're ancient, they've been on the planet for 200 million years, and they do really important things for you. Those were not in our talks. So it's just a step back, 
articulate shortly, and then move through the science. So it's a really interesting question you've just asked. I don't know, but it's definitely the Mesoamerican reef. Yeah. Actually, I've got to go to the guy in front. I'm coming to you next, because he had his hand up next. Thank you very much. It's a privilege to be here. Um, I'm curious about scale up and the yeah. bottlenecks associated with it. Selective breeding is hard. Not everybody can run a DNA yeah. sequencer. That's and right. So with decentralized scale up, um, what are some of the bottlenecks you see? And I include education because knowing how to do bioinformatics sure. is hard. So how can we stimulate you know, yeah. uh, getting yeah. through those bottlenecks? I mean, the distribution of knowledge about corals are alive. They're important to you. Getting that message out to as many people as you can possibly get it out to. If we don't get that message out, all the science, regardless of how good it is, will sit in scientists' lab notebooks and will never move down the product pipeline. I keep saying, when I talk to business people about this, I say, this is just a product. It's a new product. We need to get it to market. We need to do it quickly because the market will disappear if we don't. It's, it's language that business people understand Hook, line, and sinker. I never need to say any more than that. And they'll say, well, what is the, the state of the product? And I'll say, this is where we are with the product. These are bottlenecks. We need to address them. Cryopreservation. We don't know how to cryopreserve the eggs of coral or the tissues or the larvae. Right? That is crackable by people who do cryopreservation in human systems. So it's not us that will crack that. It's the specialists in cryopreservation who will crack it with us there to help. Well, yeah, we need to assess the biology in the following ways to make sure that they're back. So it's, it's a, a collective effort. And again, I keep saying, choose the thing that you can do in your life right now. And if you're interested in this subject, tell me what that is and let us provision you with information and let's get that moving. Right? Because it's just amazing to me how magnifying. I give a talk, and then I get an email. Maybe three months later, I was in your talk, and I had a thought, what do you think about that? And we'll start the dialogue, and inevitably we, we end up saying, well, that would be a really good if you could introduce me to that person. It's an amazing thing. It just moves, and energy builds, and once the energy and momentum builds, it won't be stoppable. And that's what we need. We need an unstoppable movement. So let's get busy. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Yes. There we are, Karen. Thank I'll you. come over here. Two more questions. I'll come over here. You want second. me to? Um, <laughs> Thank you. I'm very honored by that. I wish I were, but I'm not. <laughs> but I love them. They are fantastic. Thank you. We have, we have a lot of plastics yes. in, on, you know, on, yes. on the planet, and it's everywhere. It's yes. in the fish, it's yeah. in our bodies, it's in the atmosphere, it's everywhere. Yes. Could you address this as yes. far as how it's affecting the corals? It's bad news. I'm just going to say that. There are so many particles of plastic in the ocean, and when they drag across the reef, they're essentially taking microbes and moving them across the system. And if they just happen to be carrying infective agents, then there's just distribution of that infective agent. That would never have happened before, right? So this plastics problem, I think, is going to be a catastrophic problem for us. I mean, people are acting to change very quickly. And that's really heartening to see people just eradicating straws, single-use plastics. I mean, there are many, many laws that are being pushed forward to change our behavior for us. Because I think the people who are in power recognize, if we don't get a handle on this, we're in deep trouble because that big patch of garbage in the middle of the Pacific is way bigger than we thought it was. So, you know, this is a great question because we can solve the problem for climate change and then have a crisis around plastics. Right? It's, we've just got to clean up our act. We've just got to, right? Thank you. Karen, I'll take the last question. Oh, and I'm going to come back to talk to other people. That's what I'm going to do. Ruth, thank you so much for a great talk. Um, two years ago, my kid participated in the San Francisco International Film Festival, so I got a chance to see a bunch of these films. Yeah. And there was a film by some uh, people, I don't know if they were uh, coral reef biologists, but they did a project where they took the bones of a boat that was metallic 
and they very weakly electrified it. So they ran a cord up to shore with some solar panels, yes. and with this weak electric current, they found that these explants of coral grew significantly better than in the controls. So yes. my question is, have you ever heard of this? Yes. Why on earth would corals do better with this electric current? And yes. could you use this to create like a broodstock for your um, very resilient corals? Yes. So this electrifying the reef has actually been in the coral literature for and in use for the last 30 years. And it is a very controversial discussion. So many experiments have been done under certain, certain circumstances on the reef. And some of the corals will grow quickly, but they collapse very quickly. So the skeletons are a different density. And the ultimate outcome is a, a surge of growth collapse. So there's a real problem, because really what you want is to surge of growth, really solid structure. It would be great if that was the case, but there is no experimental evidence that on the long term, the electrification actually builds a better reef, which is what we really want. We want a better reef. Is some reef better than no reef? Absolutely. But we want a reef that can sustain the storms that come across reefs. So the fragile, and there's been a lot of discussion also about the trees that are used to grow fragments of some of the important corals in the Caribbean. And Recently, a scientist compared the density of the skeletons of corals grown on these trees and those grown when they're attached to the bottom. And they were completely different. And they were the same individual. So there are caveats to large-scale growth. And there are things that we need to do really well and track over time. But some of these things are telling us something really important about the deposition of calcium, carbonate, which is the skeleton. And we should be open to that rather than, oh, it collapsed, it doesn't work. Maybe we need to reduce the voltage. Maybe we need to think differently about how we configure the current. Um, so I don't dismiss it out of hand, but it's a complicated story because there's really one individual in the world who is selling that technology to as many people as will buy it and doing these big push and then walking away. And all of those systems have collapsed. So it's very, very complicated because someone's livelihood is in the mix. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Please join, give me a big Thanks very much, it was wonderful. Thank you. We're good. so excited to have you, you bring this Ocean optimism is what we call Gotta it. Gotta have it. We can fix it. Thank you very much. We're gonna do Thank it. You. Yep, gonna be done. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you. Uh -huh.